Welcome everybody. This episode we're going to talk about how we can add data to the database through our Next.js application. This is going to be different than we've done with get static props because get static props is ran at build time. The thing with adding data is it's all done at runtime. The ability to say click a button and submit that data to the database, we will need to interact with an API, which we've already done all of this inside of React earlier on in the series. So if you need to get the bare basics of posting data, check that out. The difference here is that we're going to go through this process with Next.js and learn how to add data to a MongoDB database. Then you'll be able to see the difference between getting data and posting data with Next.js. Another very important thing we need to talk about is what happens if you add data, but that cache has not been invalidated. How do you ensure the user gets the most up-to-date data? That's a really important part of Next.js that we're going to talk about. So we're going to follow the convention that we also did for our Django API, where we have the customers that accepts get and post. Post will be used for adding an individual customer. So you can see down here we have the form to add new content. This is all written within the same function, and we could accept get or post, and we just check to see which one was being used. We're going to do a very similar thing in Next.js, which reminder is going to be very similar code to what you would see in Node.js as well. So here we are in our API, customers, and then index.tsx, which is going to be the API endpoint for all of our customers. We currently have a function to get all of our customers, which is being invoked all of the time. So this is the actual function for hitting the API. What we can do is we can check what request method is being used. So to do this, we're going to use a property on the request so we can check what method is being used. And that's going to be req.method. And this is a property so we will check if this is get. If it is, then we will execute the existing code we already have. If it's something else, then we can change what code we're executing. So we'll say else if request.method is post, then we can execute another function down here. I also kind of think it's funny that dot method is a property and not a method. So if it's post, we would expect a customer to be sent with the request. This will be very similar to what we did for a single customer where we have the ability to post data here. That data can be found in the request.body. Now let's go ahead and go through an example with just this. So we will console log what we have so far. And we will also talk about what the data format is expected to look like when we want to hit this API. Now for this, I'm going to use postman and we will want to hit HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000 slash API slash customers. And then this is going to be a post request. Then in the body, we will say raw and make this of type JSON. And we will just put in an object directly here. This should closely resemble the document structure in MongoDB. So let's go ahead and get all the customers to see the response. You can use one of these as an example and then just change some values. But this is what we would expect to send to the server. So we'll paste that here. It's a little funky on the formatting, no big deal. We can just fix that real quick. And we're not going to submit an ID because MongoDB is going to automatically generate that for us. This guy is going to be named API call, pretty cool name, huh? And this industry is going to be APIs. Another thing we can do before we submit this is we can actually return this. So we could say response.status and say 200.json passing back the request.body. That way it doesn't just hang. And then when we submit this, we should get their object sent back to us. So looks good. Now all we have to do is create a document in MongoDB using this data. So we can create another function instead of get customers, it'll be add customer. And we'll say export const add customer async. And the first thing we will do in here is get a reference to the Mongo client. Mongo client is await client promise, which we defined in earlier videos a couple ago. And then const response. Now, how do we make this query? First off, we will say await mongo client dot db dot collection pass in customers dot insert 
one, and in here is where we will pass the body. Now we are defined in a function now, so we can't just say req.body. Instead, we're going to take that passed in, so we'll define a parameter, and we'll just call it customer. This is going to be of type customer, and that's what we will pass in here, so we'll type customer there. This should return a response dot inserted ID, which we can return back to the user so they know what the new ID of the added customer is. So I'll say return response dot inserted ID. And now that we know what we're returning, if you want, you can type the return to say that this is going to be an object ID. And we're going to import this from MongoDB. And it's actually going to be a promise because this is going to be awaited since it's async. That's all that's going to be returned from MongoDB. If you wanted to return the whole object, you could add that ID back to the object sent in the body and send it back to the client. Or what would probably be more appropriate would be to get the actual document from the database using that ID and sending it back to the client. But that's going to require another database call so I don't really think that's ideal. So I'm going to stick with just giving them back the ID. Whatever the consumer of that API wants to do with that is up to them. If they want to make that additional request to get the full customer data, they could request a customer by ID, which we built that functionality in the previous episode. Kind of rambling there, but just mentioning a few different options. I think the best of them is to return just the inserted ID. Now let's go ahead and invoke add customer from our API. We will say, add customer passing in request.body and this is going to have a response so we'll say const response await add customer and actually a better name would be added id or even inserted id just to be consistent inserted id and then that is what we will return inserted id now this is kind of annoying because we typed what we were expecting to be returned from this where we were expecting an array of customer. That was before we accounted for the different methods. So I think what we can do is just remove that. And now we're not getting the additional protection if we tried to return something bogus, but that's a little bit of an easier way to do this. Alternatively, you could say or. So you could say it's of type return or it's of type object ID that would work as well okay save let's try this out we will submit this data and we get an object ID back sweet so let's go ahead and copy this value which we can then pass in to customers with a get request and that will retrieve all of that customers data and we should be able to see this on the customers page as well now you can see the data down there and passing in the ID you can see we get that customer's name. Now there are some challenges and limitations you should be aware of. First off, this is no SQL. You can put whatever data you want and that'll be inserted into the database. Could be good, could be bad, depending on the use case. You can of course be a little bit more picky inside of the API endpoint on what to actually send back to the database. So we're going to go through a quick example of that now. Let's go ahead and go back to what we were originally doing, which was making a post request to API customers. And let's go ahead and send some bogus data. Tacos, delicious. My subscriber goal, ambitious. Dropping some rhymes here. We will send that. And we got an object ID, so we successfully put that in the database. Let's try another one here. My favorite numbers, which are in fact one, two, and three. Really good numbers. And we get an object ID. So we can basically just throw whatever the heck we want in here and it's just gonna go in the database. Taking a look at our customers, you can go into customers and take a look at our data. You see, here's the one we just put in there with a nested array. If you're going to allow arbitrary data to be submitted through the API, it's probably a good idea to have some level of authorization. So that way people aren't just spamming your database with junk. It's probably good to have authorization either way, but just an added note. So what we can do is instead of adding the customer from request.body, we could create a new object here. And let's just call this customer. And this will have a name which will come from request.body.name and this will have an industry which will come from request 
www.body.industry. Now any other properties are just going to be ignored because this is the object we're going to actually send to the database. And we should be able to say that this is of type customer. And this is an interesting problem we haven't ran into yet. The ID is required on the customer type we created, which up to this point has made sense because we haven't actually built a customer without an ID until now. So I'll just go change the type structure for the customer. So we'll go to definition and say that this is optional, which changes a lot of our other code. So such as right here when we are displaying the customer ID, although I can't think of a better way of doing this right now. So I think it would be fine just to say conditional chaining here to grab ID if it exists, which it should in this case. However, for consistency, I want to use the same type for this API as well. So it should work now. This is where I was saying you could add that ID back to the customer on success. So you could take the inserted ID, add it to this customer object, and then return customer here. However, this should work fine for now. And the behavior you should expect is that when we send data like this, the actual object in the database will have a name null and industry null. We can check for the scenario where the name and industry don't have a value, but you should have also noticed that these properties, which don't line up with anything, did not make it to the database, which is a nice bonus if you are expecting them to follow a specific structure. So let's go ahead and check for the name and industry. Let's assume if we wanted these both to be required, we could say if request.body.name and request.body.industry, then what we wanna do is all this. Otherwise, what we're going to do is create a different response with a status 400 dot json and we can just pass in um, either a string here or you could do a custom object with say an error property and let's say this error was name and industry are required now this is going to cause a problem again with that return type so you can add that here if you wish so we should expect an error property which is of type string and let's try this now so we will submit this data and we get an error name and industry are required. It's also worth noting that MongoDB does have schema validation. So if you want to make certain things required, you can look into defining a JSON schema that all of the documents in a collection must adhere to. We're not going to go into that in this episode. So I was just showing some backend code validation, but the approach that you want to do this with is totally up to you. The only non-suitable solution for this validation that I would not say is okay is some form of front-end validation, such as if you had a form and you were restricting data in only HTML and front-end JavaScript, because this could all be bypassed. So you need to have that validation on the back-end code or ideally the database. Now I want to just make sure this is working with valid data. So let's go ahead and create a name. And let's say you're my customer. And the industry you are in is the subscriber industry. And let's go ahead and send this data. So we got an object ID. Let's go ahead and retrieve this data back. Passing that into customers. Uh, and we'll make this a get request, which it actually ignored the method because we never checked for it. And you can see the only fields we retrieved are ID, name, and industry. So these favorite numbers were ignored. So that's how we can create a post endpoint inside of Next.js. There's still a lot to this, specifically how do we deal with the cache and how do we invoke this API in the front end. Definitely stay tuned for the upcoming episodes. I'm looking forward to it. I'll see you then.